All right, you got lucky. The professor's limited to nine minutes or whatever I got left. I got to get on to some leadership planning meeting. Uh, I agreed with uh, Senator Mark Warner's remarks on the uh, referendum. The country just went, uh, underwent a referendum. And one of the clearest things he says, a referendum on, on the establishment on both sides. And so I'm one of the few guys who takes it out on the establishment on both sides. So I'm glad to be part of the referendum. Y'all get that one? Right? Uh, the establishment on both sides has been off, and then uh, Senator Warren went off on free markets, etc. I did a PhD in economics at American right down the street here about 25 years ago, worked at the World Bank, etc. And uh, free markets are under attack, right? That China and India are moving toward free markets and growing at 7%, right? They're feeding the world, they're feeding 2.5 billion people in the last 20 years. When I started teaching at Randolph Macon, uh, the average Chinese and Indian was making about $1,000 a year per capita. Now they're up to 9000 So that's the greatest human welfare increase in human history that dwarfs any Harvard or triangle, right? Any efficiency triangle in the economic textbook. That's the greatest increase in human welfare in human history that dwarfs any other comparison. And what brought that about? Moving away from central government toward free market system. They both chosen that route. And so that's a challenge to all of us in this room, right? Everybody, I meet with people from corporations every day. I'm totally pro-business, et cetera. And we'll get to a couple numbers on that in a minute. Uh, but at the same time, right, the, the motto 50 years ago used to be as General Motors goes, so the nation goes. And the CEOs, uh, Warner talked about long-termism, short-term. Uh, the old CEOs that used to run the biggies used to be as concerned at their bottom line as they were for the long-run GDP growth of the country. And we got to get back to that. So he's absolutely right. Uh, but there's no substitute for having a free market system. So I always taught economics. I tell my kids in class to say, look at a house or a car or whatever. Look at your house. Can you think of one item in your house that's not regulated? And if you can't, if you can't think of one thing in your home, right, with 100,000 pieces that's not regulated, maybe we got a little too much regulation, right? Maybe you don't have free markets anymore. Just maybe, right? Just, just a thought in passing. <laughs> So I'll get back to, I kind of take it out on the establishment on both sides. Uh, but people confuse that with uh, not getting along with both sides, right? The press cast this new right wingers and left wingers and all this kind of thing. I'm a right wing knuckle dragger because I follow Adam Smith and James Madison, the two arguably brightest people in the history of Western Civ, right? And if you follow these two and vote that way, which is what I do, you get in all sorts of trouble. And the press calls your names and says they, they hate each other, there's hate up here. And all this. Total baloney, right? I work out in the weight room with uh, Keith Ellison, head of the new Triple C. I told him not to run any big money against me like next election cycle. We joke all day. I debate Vargas as a Jesuit trained religious guy from out west. We debate theology every morning. He's Catholic, right? We have fun. I was at the White House Christmas party and my wife and I are sitting there and Bernie comes walking by. Bernie Sanders. And uh, I said, hey, Brandon, Dave Brown, I'm a rookie, freshman this a year ago. I said, I, I'm going to ask you a question. You don't have to answer this. But uh, I said, I've been up here for about a year now. And I said, uh, I said, when I look around here, I don't see this right wing, left wing stuff. I said, I see both, both establishment leaderships in the middle doling out $4 trillion to their buddies. Right? So I don't see any of this right wing, left wing. I just see the middle. Right? I'm on the budget committee. And I have to call the press to ask what's going on in the budget. Right, just as a hint, right? So the leadership, five people will do the budget in a few weeks, right? So that's what's coming. So I said, uh, is, that, is that your experience, Bernie? Is it, do you see a right wing, left wing, you know, war going on up here? Or do you see, you know, the, the, the middle, a few people doling out four trillion to the cronies? He said, well, hell, Dave, what the hell do you think going on up here? That's exactly what's going on up here, right? That's a potential president. And so who just won the election? Trump, you got the biggest outsider election in history, right, arguably. You got Trump, Cruz, Rand Paul, Ben Carson, Carly Fiorina, did I leave out anybody on that side, Bernie on the other side, all outside, and it's still hard to crack in and make a change. And when you got Trump and Bernie argue, agreeing on some of these issues, you better wake up and smell the coffee. Something's going on new in the country, right? And so what is that? So I'm, I'm still telling my own leadership uh, we had the better way plan, it's a good plan. That didn't win the election, right? Some other issues animated that election. And uh, we need to get at that and put that in our agenda moving forward. 
Uh, let me get to a little bit, uh, some talk, you know, people saying, well, I'm concerned about Trump on this, I'm concerned about Trump on that, da 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 And so it's, it's fair play on both sides. Uh, when you talk about free markets and et cetera, I don't think it's an opinion piece. Uh, go look up the numbers, go look up the NFIB, right? National Federation of Independent Business, the small business group. Uh, small business responsible for 70% of jobs in the country. And go look up our scores, right? Go look, go look up everyone in Congress. Right? And there's your voting scores for the small guy. And so that separates uh, fact from fiction. I got 100. So other people in this room are either tied or lower, if you're a mathematician. Right? And so go look at those. And when everybody says they want growth, et cetera, uh, go look at those numbers. They're highly informative. Uh, let me deal with trade. Where'd my colleague Conley dumps out right after eating lunch. I'm going to give him a hard time. We get along, right? Jerry's talking on trade. Let me give you my take on trade. I'm a free trader, right? I did a PhD. Trade was one of my PhD comps, so I'm a free trader. But I'm not voting for any of the trade deals. So you say, well, you're not a free trader. No, I'm a free trader. And so let me explain the, the tension involved in that issue. Everyone says they want free markets and free trade, etc. cetera. Uh, it'd be nice to have free trade. It'd be nice to have free markets in the country anywhere, as I was saying. Right, so what's really going on when it comes to the small guy? The Wall Street Journal reported, and this is widely established, we have $2.6 trillion, $2.6 trillion per year in regulatory overhang on the backs of small business and on big business. 2.6 trillion, plus Obamacare, premiums going up 20%. I, I always tell the press, don't ask me what I think about Obamacare, that's political, right? I'll tell you what I think, but go call the first 100 small businesses in your phone book. Right, go do your job. And I'll tell you what 95% will say. It's killing me. I love my employees, I can't give them healthcare. Right, that's, that's the answer. So you got 2.6 trillion in regulatory overhang, crushing the economy, Obamacare, et cetera, and I'm just, you know, I won't get into detail. On the back of the small guy. And then uh, China and India don't have that cost burden. Right, they're free market and they're not as rich and as you get rich you get more regulation, you want clean air and clean water, which is all good stuff, right? But they don't have 2.6 trillion or that ratio of cost burden on them, so they have much lower costs. And we have much higher costs. And so when it comes to trade agreements and free trade, it seems a little cynical to say, hey, we don't have a level playing field whatsoever. We're crushing you with regulations. Let's open up to free markets uh, internationally when we don't have any at home, right? And good luck to you, small guys, right? So let's trade. Right? So that, that's trade in a nutshell, right? And in the PhD books or whatever, you do free trade, both countries gain, right? Ricardo's trade theory. But there's an asterisk after that in the book. And it says uh, both countries gain, but with the gains, you can help the losing sectors, right? And so that's Southern Virginia, textiles, manufacturing, this kind of stuff, right? And I don't think the way you help those sectors is through welfare programs. You need to revitalize through technological growth or innovation or human capital and education. I agree with what Senator Kane was just saying. We got to do that, right? And so dollars are going to be very scarce coming up, and uh, that's where it should go. Or the middle will continue, right? Wages have been flat for 30 years, and they'll continue to be flat. And uh, if they're flat, we're going to have social upheaval uh, for a lot longer. What am I already over? All right, let me give you the budget. No, I'll just give you my talking points on the budget. Everyone on the other side of the aisle has great budget concerns uh, I hear today, but I'm on the budget committee. The other side of the aisle doesn't have a budget that balances in any horizon. We struggle heroically to try to come up with a budget that balances in 10 years, which is kind of a fiction. And I tell my constituents and then I write articles on it day by day, right? So I take it to my own side on fiscal responsibility. That will be the elephant in the room with Trump coming on board, right? There's no doubt about it. So that I. I try to tell the truth wherever I go. Trump's going to be a huge challenge on the fiscal responsibility piece. Uh, we got 20, the, the debt is about ready to cross 20 trillion, right? It's right at about 19.8 right now. Uh, right as we got a new president and we go into March and we're going to do the debt ceiling increase right there, right? So we're going to have to have a vote on a debt ceiling increase right when the debt clock hits 20 trillion, right? That's the beauty of my new job. Right? So think about that vote for a while, right? Debt isn't the most pressing issue. The most pressing issue is the unfunded liabilities. They're $100 trillion. They used to be $127 trillion when I ran. 
They used to be posted on the debt clock, now they're not for some reason, it's all hidden. That's Medicare, Social Security, uh, Medicaid, Bush Prescription Drug Plan, et cetera. Interest on that. It's mandatory spending. It's two-thirds of the budget. It's in law. We cannot change that on the Budget Committee. In 10 years, <clears throat> all federal revenues will go to those mandatory spending programs. Did you get that? In 10 years, all federal revenues will go to only the mandatory spending programs. Do you think that will affect Virginia in any way, shape, or form in your budgets? and then down onto localities, it's a done deal. So another way of putting it, if what I just said is true, and it's the main graph at CBO, right? Congressional Budget Office is the main graph. Go out and make sure Brat's doing proper economics. What that means is in 10 years, uh, how much money will be left over for the military? Zero. Does the military affect uh, the Virginia economy? As Connolly was saying, it's a third? Yes. How much money left over for education? Zip. Transportation, zip, right? That's where we're headed. So state money's flowing from the feds. It's going to dry up. Local money's going to dry up. There's going to be huge pressure on property taxes, uh, et cetera. Another way of putting that is that the deficit will have to deficit finance the entire discretionary budget in 10 years. That's the flip side of that, right? So if all federal monies are gone, there's zero left for any of that, you have to deficit finance the entire discre discretionary federal budget. That number right now is forecast to be $1.2 trillion. That's the current cost of the discretionary budget, right? So that's where we're heading. And so the state planners, I just talked to all the state uh, finance people, all the state leaders from all the counties a couple weeks ago in the room. I said, you all familiar with this? And they said, no. I said, it's unbelievable, right? So, so this is in law. This isn't my opinion. The budget committee can't change it. To change the mandatories, you have to pass law through the House and the Senate and uh, overcome a veto. So we got some heavy lifting uh, to go. Uh, it's clear you got to get economic growth, right? So I'm glad the other side is Warner. I think he's pro-growth. He wants to be growth. Kane is, he, he's, Senator Kane is a friend. He said, I'm my friend Dave. He really is. He's been a great guy to me uh, since I've been up here kindly. Bobby Scott, Bobby still here. He's polite. He's the one who's polite. He waited for me to speak. Thank you, Bobby. He's been a good friend. I was going to run against him for Senate if Kane went up there. I was just thinking about it. <laughs> and I went to seminary, so I can't run any negative ads, right? I didn't run any negative against Canner or my last Democrat, so I can't run any. I so I was going to ask him, Bobby, you going to go negative on me or not? But I don't think he would. He's a nice guy. All right, so we all get along. Uh, let's uh, spread the faith. We're going to need it going forward. We'll try to keep Trump on the fiscal train. I will, right? I get in trouble with everybody. I'm on everybody's case. I just do the numbers. And whatever they are, that's what I say. So I get in trouble every day of my life. So thank you for letting me have a few words. And uh, thank you. I got to run off. Thank you.